Hey everybody, welcome to the 63rd edition of Drive Through Review. Today I'm going to talk about Attila. It is a game from Carl Heinz Schmiel, who did D Mocker and several other games. Uh, this is nowhere near the weight of something like D Mocker. It actually plays two to five players in, it says, 45 minutes. Your first game probably is not going to be 45 minutes long, it's going to be uh, somewhat longer than that. It actually plays good with two. So, Andy, <laughs> you can rest easy. Uh, there's a couple of small rule changes for two. I would say it's not best with two, but I still enjoy it with two. It is a game that is sort of similar to, let's say, like an El Grande type of game. It's area control, but it also reminds me of Liberté, which is a Martin Wallace game. Uh, there's a lot of card play. There's some area control. And for some reason, it kind of reminds me of like an Airlines or even a little bit of a small layering of stock uh, game like that. So let me just jump into how it works and I'll come back and tell you what I think. So the overall gist of this game is that there are several Germanic tribes fleeing Attila the Hun and trying to establish colonies or you know little civilizations inside of what's left of Rome. So you can see you've got a map of Rome here on the board uh, and basically six colors of these little sort of busts that represent each of the different tribes. Um, basically players are going to be using cards to play these tribes out in these different regions of the Roman Empire. So in addition to the board and the colored tokens here for the tribes and the cards, players are also going to have seven cubes in their color. And one of these cubes is going to go on this score track around the board here while the other six are going to be placed at the bottom of these influence tracks. And you can see you've got one track for each color of the tribes in the game. And so as a player uh, you know, gains influence on one of these tracks, they're just going to move up this board. And this is going to help determine scoring during the scoring rounds of whoever is the highest you know, up on this track. Players will also get a little token in their player color just to signify who they are, as well as three tokens for different abilities that can be used once per game. So when a player uses an ability, they'll flip this over and then they can't use that ever again in the game. And I'll explain these abilities a little bit later. In the top right hand corner of the map, there will be stacks of these little peace tokens here. So in this case, there'll be one token there, two tokens there, three there, and then finally four there. And this will sort of act as a timing mechanism for the end of the game, as well as dictate how players will receive influence as the game progresses. And I'll explain that in more detail. So very simply, you can see this board divided into several regions. And in addition to there being adjacency across a border, you can see some of the areas are have adjacency signified by these arrows here. Players are gonna start the game with six cards. And very simply on a turn, what a player will do is play a card and then they'll discard it over here. So this island here is not part of the board, so this is where we just put our cards in our discard pile for everybody to have access to. So if I had played this black card here, then I would be able to take a black token and place it in one of the regions on the board. Now the first time that this black tribe comes into play, it must border one of the six regions that has a red border. So I could play it here, 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 or here, or here, to be its first placement. So I could place it here, for example. After this, I could either place it another black tribe marker there, or in an adjacent region to any of the existing regions, or in adjacency to one of the red bordered regions. In this manner, the tribes will kind of grow across the Roman countryside and start to settle. Now when you play a card, you can take one of two actions. First you'll play the card, and then you must play a marker in that color at which point you'll have a choice. The choice is between either playing a second marker of that color or taking influence in that color. So if I had chosen not to play a second marker in that color, I would basically just move my cube one step up the influence. So you can either play two markers or play one marker and then take an influence. Once that is done, you'll draw back up to six cards and then that's your turn. So it's very simple. The basic turn is gonna be very simple. So here I set up a couple of turns in and there's been some red and yellow markers placed and I'm going to create what's called a conflict. Now each of these regions has a maximum capacity for four markers. Now let's say it came to be my turn and I play a yellow card here. 
Now if I placed a yellow here for example, this has now added the fifth marker to this region. At this point immediately we're going to have a conflict. Now at this point I and any other players around the table can play cards to try to influence this conflict here. And the way that you do that is you can play cards that match any of the colors of markers that are in there. And what players are going to do is they're going to play cards face down. They're going to show how many cards they played. So if I put all three of these cards face down, I'd put them down. And then around the table, everybody's going to put a certain number of cards down. At which point we're going to reveal all of the cards. And then we're going to add up the total count between all of the markers and all of the cards. So in this case, we've got one, two, three, four, five yellows and one, two, three reds. At that point, any of the tribes that are having the least number of influence counting the cards and the markers are going to be instantly removed off of the map. Now if there's a tie, then they're all going to be removed off the map. So in this case, if we had had three red cards played and two yellow, adding up to five each, then they would all be removed. In addition, if there were ever all of the same color in there, then all of those would be removed because technically they're all tied for the least amount. So this is a key aspect of the game. Now what's going to happen is once you remove any of the tribes, let's say for in this case we still had three yellows left, we're going to take one of these markers up here and place that in here like so. And this basically means that no longer can any markers be played in there for any reason at all. Now as you remove the markers up here in the right hand corner, we're going to have a scoring round. So in this case there was only one marker on the top space here. So since this space is now empty, we're going to immediately score all of the influence and the control that players currently have on the board. Now you can see in this space there's two markers and there's three markers here. So if we had had another conflict here, let's say we put that one there, we wouldn't yet score again for a second time. We'd have to wait till this stack was totally empty, at which point we'd have another scoring round. So let me explain the scoring a little bit. So you're basically going to be scoring first and second place in each of the colors. Now here I just got yellow and green set up here. But you're going to go through all the colors and score the whoever has the highest and the second highest. Now the first highest is going to score one point for each marker of this color on the board. So in this case the yellow player would get one point for each yellow marker on the board. The white player here is going to get one point for each region that a yellow marker exists in. And same way here with the green. The yellow player will get one point for each marker on the board, and the white player will get one marker for each region that a green marker exists in. So if we set up this purely fictional scoring opportunity, whoever has the most influence in yellow will get one, two, three, four, five points. Whoever has second place in yellow will get one, two, three for each region. Now, for some reason, only one player is on the board for yellow in terms of influence, they'll get both. So they get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight for all of the pawns and all of the regions. If there was a tie, then you basically add up all those points and then divide it by two. Now you can see that as we reveal these, not only are we going to do different scoring rounds, we're also going to change the amount of influence that we take when we take the influence action. So at the start of the game, when you play a card, either play a pawn, and then play another pawn, or you play a pawn and take one influence. Well, after this tile is gone, when you choose to take influence, you're actually going to take two influence. After these pile is gone, you're going to take three influence and then four. So it kind of allows players to catch up. Now the game is going to end when we place this last piece marker out in the regions, and then we do the scoring. And then we're going to immediately do a second scoring, sort of a final scoring. So this is one way for the game to end. Once all these piece markers are removed, then the game will end. The second way a game will end is if any uh, particular tribe's color markers are exhausted and totally placed on the board. At that point we'll do a final scoring once the last one is placed and then the game ends. The final way that the game will end is when any of the player's markers hit one of these tops. So if, let's say the black player was running red all the way up really quickly. As soon as he hits the top we're going to do a final scoring and then the game will end in that way as well. Now let me explain the three different special actions that a player can take. So on your turn, you can choose one of these. You can never do like two actions on a turn. I couldn't do this one and then this one. I can only do one of them on a turn. And then as soon as I use it, I'll flip it over and I can no longer take this action for the rest of the game. So if you take this action here, it kind of shows some cards being shuffled in and out. You can flip this over and then discard as many cards as you want and then draw that many cards 
back into your hand. Just a way of recycling your hand. This one that kind of shows two cards being played, you'll play this and basically get a second turn. So you'll play one card and place a pawn and then place another pawn or take influence and then flip this if you want and then place another card and do the same thing. Finally, this little arrow here means you can take two influence for free straight up a track. So you can either take two influence in one track or one influence in two separate tracks. Now the difference with a two player game is instead of playing one card, you play two cards on your turn. Additionally, when they, in a two player game you use this double turn marker, you just take a third turn. So you can get up to three turns with this turn marker in a two player game. Finally, in a two player game, you must be within two spaces of the person above you on any of these influences tracks to be considered as second place. You can't just, you know, get one influence and let him ride it all the way to the top and you keep cherry picking the influence. You've got to kind of keep up with him on each of these influence tracks to get those second place points. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that overview. Uh, the first few times I played this, it was a little bit sort of different feeling. Uh, nobody was really sure what to do. We just kind of played cards and as things developed. So you didn't really kind of develop a strategy until sort of the end of the first game. And, but this gameplay is actually pretty quick because you can run up the influence track one way or, you know, get all the black pawns out. And so the game can end pretty quickly if somebody wants to just, you know, force that end game to happen. And then it maybe will extend to about an hour, let's say, with somebody, you know, where it just happens that all of the piece markers get removed and we do all of the different scorings possible. Uh, there's relatively a lot of luck in this game. I don't really have a problem with that though because it does play so fast and it's there's a little bit of bluffing there and it's a, just sort of a little different feel. So the fact that it plays fast enough and it's not totally a... Uh, you gotta use your brain, you know. It's, it, it's You're still kind of constrained by the cards but it plays fast and quick enough again that it's not you know a huge deal if you get wiped out but it's not on the other hand just kind of doing going through the motion so to speak there's still some good decisions to make and it's interesting to try to pick and choose how many influence tracks you're going to try to go up because you can't spread yourself too thin you don't want to just go up one track to a certain extent you want to kind of go up a few to you know stay in the running and you got to kind of pick and choose your battles and there's some cool little you know gotcha moments that you can do to sort of wipe out somebody's uh, pawns on the board and things like that. So it's really kind of quick and fun and relatively thematic where you've got these tribes coming in and you're sort of trying to politically influence them with your cards. I think that's the part that it reminds me of Liberté where you're sort of backing one faction and then when it comes time to resolve a conflict everybody's playing those cards to sort of break the tie or you know swing the influence one way or the other. And then you know you've got kind of the stock aspect with you, you're in a sense your own stock in each of the six tribes or influence and you're sort of backing the tribe that way and you want that one to score quite a lot but you've also got to be careful where if you're spreading your guys all over the map whoever's in second place is going to get just almost as much points as you if you've got like one guy in each territory because you either get points for all the pawns or points for each region that color pawn is in so you got to be kind of smart about that. So there's, it's, it has a real sort of organic flow to how the game plays. And again, a lot of luck with the cards, but I think it's manageable and the game should play fast enough. After everybody kind of gets used to how you should play it, I think people look at it maybe and they go, ooh, are you serious, zero? And then they go, well, I have to totally, you know, AP my decisions, but it's not that kind of game. So... I think it's an interesting game. There's probably better area control games, but it sort of has a unique flavor, a unique take. So I think I think it's fun. So thanks.